I hadn't planned it this way, but we will continue reading where we left off last Sunday morning. So we'll be in verse number 15, Luke 2, 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they'd seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Human beings are always trying to figure out the meaning of the events that happen in their lives. They want to know the cause, they want to know the effect of all the things that are taking place in their life. For instance, if the head of a major corporation announces some change in the company, all the employees want to know, what does this mean to me? What is the ramification? He's making this change. What does this mean? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is my job in jeopardy or not? At the same time, the stock market We'll go crazy for a couple of days trying to figure out what does this mean in the stock, to the worth of the value of this company. And so they're all trying to figure out the meaning of the things that are happening. When politicians meet behind closed doors, the news media will go crazy trying to figure out what in the world is going on and what does this mean. The kids at Meyer Hall will sit and talk, they'll get a call from their attorney. And for the rest of the afternoon, they will ponder every single word that their attorney said to them, trying to figure out, what does this mean to my court case? A young man may talk with a young lady for 30 seconds. He secretly likes this girl. She doesn't know it. He talks to her for 30 seconds. And for the next three days, he mulls over every single word that was said. The eyebrow raised. When she said that one word, her eyebrow raised. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? <laughs> you know, you were there. You know how this works. You want to know the meaning of, what, of the events that happen in your life. You want to know what these things mean. Human beings want to know the, the meaning behind the events. You know, this is what Mary was doing. She was pondering the events that had taken place. She is trying to figure out what do they mean. That's what the verse says. Verse number 19, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, she didn't really have a ton of information. She had some Old Testament prophecies. She had a visit from an angel. She had a conversation with Elizabeth, who was also expecting She had Joseph's dream, and she had a strange visit from some some shepherds after she had delivered, and that they told her that they had also been visited by angels. And it was with this particular information, she sat there pondering, trying to figure out exactly what does all of this mean. Now, we don't know exactly what her conclusions were. The information about Mary is very limited, and she's only mentioned a few more times in the scriptures after this. But this morning, I want to ponder with her. What did these events mean? What did they prove? What did they infer? What can we learn from the things that Mary knew? As she's pondering them at heart, let's ponder with her. We have a distinct advantage. For we have the completed New Testament. And the old-timers had a saying... Hindsight is 2020. Hindsight is 2020. We look back on these events, we'll have a lot easier time pondering them and coming up with conclusion that maybe Mary did. Title of this morning's message, Pondering with Mary. Pondering with Mary. Let's pray. 
Father, this is your word, and you have given us a copy. And we are responsible to read it and to obey it. But Father, we need your teaching by your spirit to make it clear in our minds. We come to obey your word, Father. We come to understand it. But we readily admit our inefficiencies here and ask that you would do in us what needs to be done. Let your spirit teach your word to us this morning and change each heart in the way that it needs specifically changed. And we thank you in advance for the grace that allows this to take place. For we ask this in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. As Mary sat there pondering all of the events that had taken place, one of the first conclusions she should have come to was the fact that, number one, God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. Now, in fact, we know that Mary came to this conclusion. If you look in Luke chapter number 1, where she is uh, speaking with Elizabeth, in verse number 54, she says, He hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he hath spoke, spake to our, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. She realized this, that God always keeps his promises. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, this sin caused them to be removed from the garden and separated from God. At that moment, God promised them a Savior, some who would, someone who would come and deal with the sin and bring them back to God. They were promised this. In fact, an animal was slain and the the, the coat of the, the skin of this animal was given to them for coat for clothing as a picture of the savior who was to come they were given this promise eve knowing that this promise had happened like most human beings thought it would happen right away and she actually believed that her firstborn son was the savior now she was way off base on this obviously because the firstborn son was Yes, Cain, who murdered, okay? And so this was, she was way off base on this, but she thought that God would keep his promise right then, and she thought that's who it was. Time and time again, this Savior was promised through the Old Testament and were referred to when Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac as a picture of the coming Christ. The promise was prophetically given through Abraham, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. And a ram was caught there by its head in the thicket. They had pictures of Christ. They had promises of Christ coming. But the years rolled by with hints and illustrations, but no Messiah. Finally, in 700 B.C., Isaiah is given a specific prophecy. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now they knew what to look for, but they still did not have fulfillment of this prophecy or this promise. Time kept passing. It would have been easy to just decide this thing is never going to take place. If you think about 700 years it had been thousands of years up to this point, but from Isaiah to the birth of Christ, you're talking about 700 years. You could think this thing is never, ever going to take place. And then an angel comes to Mary. God always keeps his promises. Why did it take so long? Eve thought, this is going to happen right away. And then thousands and thousands of years take place before this event happens. Why did it take so long? Galatians 4, 4 tells us that in the fullness of time. Look, you know what? God is not interested in just getting something done. God always does things in the right way, in the right time. Yes. 
And so he was always, he was always going to fulfill his word, but he had to be at the right time. And in the fullness of time, we have the birth of Christ. He always keeps his word. I'm not much on Christmas music. A lot of the Christmas songs have not got a lot of, we'll say, meat to them. A lot of them are just kind of words that you sing out, and they're kind of cute to sing and fun to sing, but there's not a lot of meat to them. But there are some, if you pay attention, that are just very, very solid. One of my favorite ones, I think we sang it this morning, What Child Is This? This, this is Christ the King. Now, we just sing that very quickly, and you don't pay any attention to it. But do you understand what that means? What child is... They're looking at this baby, and this child is the fulfillment of what was promised thousands of years ago, whom the whole world has been waiting for, is now here. This is that child. My friends, that's exciting. Yes. And it tells you, if Mary was thinking, she came to the conclusion... God always keeps His Word. This baby in the manger is not just some child. It is the long-awaited fulfillment of a promise of God. He is the Messiah the Jews have been looking for. He is the Savior that was promised. And Mary pondered the event and she concluded, God always keeps His promise. Number two. Another conclusion she would come to that she could have inferred is that God is powerful. God is powerful. In fact, she came to this conclusion as well. In verse number 49 of chapter number 1, she says, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. He that is mighty hath done great things. You know, the virgin birth is often scoffed in the world. The virgin birth is not scoffed because it's difficult. Human beings often deal with difficult things. We don't have a problem with difficult. In fact, I was watching it again yesterday. Heather and AJ gave me a DVD about the Voyager uh, space craft that they built in the 70s. And I was watching it again yesterday. You talk about a difficult deal. They wanted to send this thing out, and it was supposed to go forever out there, in, with 70s technology. You remember the 70s? I remember the 70s. <laughs> Some of you, you guys don't remember the 70s. You remember the 70s technology? Do you remember plastic in the 70s? My grandpa used to swear, ah, that junk stuff. Now everything's made out of plastic. But in the 70s, the technology... You remember the radios? Your, your transistor radio was like that big. The 70s technology, they're trying to build a spacecraft that will travel almost without end. But they've got to fold the whole thing up and shoot it out of a rocket from, to get it into space and then have it unfold itself into the size of a large vehicle or a small house. That's difficult, Right? And this video was talking about all the difficulties they faced in order to try to make this thing happen. What? Human beings do difficult all the time. We don't have any trouble with difficult. What we have trouble with is impossible. And when you talk about the virgin birth, you come up with, that is impossible. And that is where we fail. That is where the scoffing comes in because we look at this from with our human mind and say, that's not just difficult, that cannot happen. And that's because we leave God out of the equation. Right. For nothing is impossible with God. No, so the people around Mary, they looked and they couldn't see the impossible and they said, ha ha, right. But Mary knew the truth. And as she sat there pondering, she knew that this wasn't a difficult thing to happen. This was an impossible thing to happen. 
And Mary realized, concluded through her ponderings, God is powerful. Do you know this is what part of our problem? In our life, we look at our life and the difficulties that we're facing, the, the, the things that are happening that we don't know how they could ever work out, and we, we just we kind of throw up our hands and say, it's going to always be that way. Why? Because we leave God out of the equation. We look at the situation through our own human eyes and say, this is more than difficult. I don't see how this could ever happen. And you forget that you have a God who is powerful. He does the impossible. That's his specialty. And if you would ponder, what, as Mary pondered, you would realize the fact that you have a God of the impossible. And this is what Mary concluded, that God is not only keeps his promise, but he is powerful. The third thing Mary could have inferred as she pondered is that the price of sin is high. The price of sin is high. I guess I'm getting to be an old man. And some of you are here in the same boat as me. But I can remember... <coughs> when nativity scenes were everywhere. Do you remember when the small towns, almost every small town had a nativity scene in its center, the, the, the courthouse, the, the town square? How many can remember that? Do you remember? They used to have them in shop windows. You'd go to a, the, the, the shopping malls and there, there'd be the windows, the, the window displays. You'd go down the street and there'd be nativity scenes in the window displays of the stores. They were everywhere. Things have changed a little in our country, but they were, maybe they're changing back a little some. Back when I was a kid, they were everywhere. Now, when you look at a nativity scene, and they were everywhere, it's hard to think about sin at that point. Because you look at a nativity scene, and it is so peaceful. You know, you got your standard Mary and Joseph, and the manger and the baby in there. And then you've got a couple, three wise men and some animals. And then thrown off to the side, because we're not sure that people are not there. They were not there, the three wise men and some camels. Kind of stick them on the outside edge of the thing. You have your standard, basic nativity scene. And you look at that and you think, oh, that's so peaceful. Oh, that's so heartwarming. Oh, that's so wonderful. And to think about sin, is not on your mind. It's not what it brings, the thought that comes to mind. But until you see your sin in the manger, you haven't seen the manger yet. You have not seen the nativity scene until you have actually seen it in that light. For what you see in this manger is actually your sin. We are very casual about our sin. We play with it. We joke with it. We rename it. We excuse it. We cover it. We tolerate it. But if you want to see what sin really costs, look carefully in the manger. This tiny baby is not mere child. He is the eternal Son of God made flesh. He's not just here to set a good example. He's not just here to go sightseeing on his creation. He is here to be a substitute. He is here to pay the sin debt of the whole world. He has come here to die. Now, he will not die as an infant. First, he must be tested. He must be proven worthy to be our substitute. He will be at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. But in the end result, the wages of sin is death. And this tiny baby in this manger will grow up and be beaten, spit upon, abused, mocked, and crucified. It's why he came. And a person who is actually pondering this manger scene can no longer excuse their sin. They can no longer just look at it as haphazard. They can no longer embrace it. It can no longer be joked about. 
Because through the birth we see the price of sin is very high. And Mary, as she pondered, realized God keeps His promise, God is powerful, but the price of sin is high. If you would ponder, you would also know that the love of God is deep. That the love of God is deep. What's your life worth? No, to each one of us, our life is worth a great deal. But what is it really worth? What is your life really worth to God? A couple of years ago, I was working on a, a wood project. We were making the, the coverings for the pipes in the basement. There's removable wood panels down there. So I was working on that project. They're made out of poplar wood. And so I had them about three quarters of the way done. And I had them down in the shop building down there, and life got busy, so I stacked them on the floor in the shop building off to the side. I stacked them down there to get back to them later. I'm going to guess it was maybe three months later. I went back to move them and to start dealing with them, and I noticed some dirt going up the side. And I thought, what in the world is that? So I started moving these panels. The termites had come through a crack in the floor, had come up and started eating through the pot, these projects. They had made a tunnel on the outside and had chewed holes through the end of these projects. Some, most, many of them had tunnels running through it, and one of them had a hole the size of my fist in the center of it that they had eaten out the center of this thing. Now. I was not very happy about this whole deal. So at that time, good friend Dale here was working for a company that dealt with these things. And so he came out and did an inspection and found out that on several buildings on the property, we had termites. Now, what were my thoughts toward those termites? Was I concerned about their well-being? I tell you what, they had destroyed my project, and I was out for blood. I was out to destroy. What do we want done? That was the question. I want it so they never, they pay for what they did, and they never come back ever again. That's what I want done. All of you are saying, yes, that's exactly right. We built a property, won't, don't want anything, eating it up and destroying it. That's fair enough, right? Now ask yourself. Isn't that what we've done to God's creation? Are you any more than a termite here? Think about it. Think about what the world is like. If you look at Hollywood, it is a cesspool of sin. If you look at the media, you have a perversion of the truth. If you look at the business world, you find corruption, dishonesty, and greed. If you look at society, you find perversion and rampant wickedness. Everywhere around you, you, you look, you find absolute disregard for the, God, the law of God. That's what you see on the planet. An absolute disregard for God's laws. But you don't have to look that far. Look in your own heart. Look in your own life and what do you see? Exactly the same thing. We're like termites destroying what God has created. Now, if God were as us, He would have exterminated the problem. That would have been fair, and that would have been just. You could even say that would have been right to do. To take care of what was destroying his creation. But what do we get? A baby in a manger. A substitute. Someone who will deal with our sin. Only someone who is completely filled with foolishness and pride would ever think that they deserved 
that substitute. We have no merit for that. But what we have is a God who loves so very, very deeply. One of the most powerful lines in the Christmas carols is, O holy night, long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. What is that telling you? God loves very deeply. From the depths of his love for you, Jesus Christ was sent. Now, until you've seen that, you have not pondered the, the birth enough. One last thing. God keeps his promises. God is powerful. Sin is costly. God's love is deep. Number five, the humility of Jesus Christ is real. The humility of Jesus Christ is real. The old timers had a saying. Do you know what it meant when the old timers used to say, he's just putting on airs? Do you know what that means? He's just putting on airs. What it means, if you're not from that generation, what it means is you're wanting people to think better of you than you really deserve. It's very common, and most people are guilty of it, at least at some level. When I was a kid, early high school, you did not want anybody to know that you shopped at Kmart. <laughs> How many remember those days? <laughs> How, do you remember the blue light specials? <laughs> that was a big deal. The blue light is fly, shining in aisle number 14. How many remember blue light specials? Okay, N none of this class up here, but <laughs> you missed out. The blue light specials at Kmart. You might have bought it from the blue light, but you didn't want anybody to know that you bought it from the blue light. People don't like new situations. Why? Because it may make them look foolish or like they don't know what they're doing. We like to put on airs. When I was in Chicago, we'd be out going, visiting house to house in these really bad neighborhoods. The houses were just pieces of junk. You know what would be parked out in front of these houses that were pieces of junk? I mean absolute pieces of junk houses. Nicer cars than anybody here drives. You say, what in the world? Why would you live in a piece of junk house and be driving this hugely expensive car? I'll tell you why. Because when you drive around a car in the car, everybody sees you. Nobody knows where you live. And so you could put on this show like I'm somebody and I got some cash and <laughs> just didn't tell anybody what house you actually lived in. And so you'd have this beautiful car sitting out in front of a piece of junk house. Why? Because we always like to be thought of better than what we are. You know, the Bible speaks of the humility of Jesus Christ. But his birth proves it. To take on human flesh would be a step down that we cannot even imagine. To be born in a barn would be embarrassing. To be wrapped in rags is unthinkable. To have lowly shepherds be the one who herald your birth, and they're your only visitors. To be born to such poor parents that they all they have to offer is two turtle doves at your dedication. Mary sat there pondering this. She would have had to have realized as she pondered, these were all specific choices that the Lord made. You didn't have a choice where you were born and who you were born to and under circumstances, but Jesus Christ was able to pick every single circumstance of his birth. That means that he picked Mary. That he means he picked the shepherds to come. That means he picked to be born because there was no room in the inn in that manger. That means he was picked to be born to such poor parents that they had to offer turtle doves at his dedication. He picked these things. Now who would pick that? He chose the manger and all that came with it. 
You cannot help but see the humility of Jesus Christ when you look into that manger. And if you ponder it, you'll have to wonder how much of that humility is reflected in my own personal life. The birth of Jesus Christ proves His humility. This Christmas, don't just sing the songs. Don't just look at the manger as a, de as a decoration. There is much to learn here if you will ponder. God keeps His promises. God is powerful. Sin is costly. God's love is deep. And Christ's humility is real. Ponder with Mary. Let's pray.